a legendary cut man in boxing and mixed martial arts, Jacob Duran came from humble beginnings. A migrant worker in the fields of California, Duran aspired for more and later pursued a career in combat sports. Learning the traits of other cut artists, Duran would display an uncanny ability to stay calm under pressure, earning him a spot to work the octagon. Known by fighters only as Stitch, Duran has since become one of the most preeminent cut men in the world. In a sport full of characters, Stitch is one of the most recognizable figures and is our guest on Fighting Words with Mike Straka. From HDNet, this is Fighting Words with Mike Straka. This week's guest, UFC Cutman, Jacob Stitch Duran. Welcome to Fighting Words. My guest tonight is perhaps the only successful crossover from the world of boxing into MMA. He is one of the most famous people you'll ever see inside the octagon, and he's not even a fighter. His name is Jacob Stitch Duran. Stitch, welcome to the show. Mike, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. How many UFCs have you been to? Well, a whole bunch, you know, with uh, counting the fight nights and the reality shows. I think I've done 13, all the reality shows, 13 of them. Uh, I started off in UFC 33 and uh, hundreds, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to fights, a whole bunch. When people get their hands wrapped by you, yeah. they seem to light their eyes light up, their whole body. It's like a pre-fight stress is at, off their back. Why do they feel so comfortable with you? Well, uh, I like to say because I have a good rap, you know, but, you know, the, the thing with that, Mike, is, is when I go in there is, you know, the fighters are, I'm the guy that's getting them ready for battle. Like the old Coliseum days, the gladiator days when you put the armor on the fighters. That's what I'm doing when I'm wrapping their hands. And this is their first indication that they're going to battle. As Frank Mir said in one of the interviews that when I see Stitch walking in the room, it feels my stomach just drops because I know it's time to go to war. That is the first step of them going into war once they get into the dressing room. And, you know, when I wrap their hands, I'll talk to them. I'll try to find out where they're coming from. Mentally, I try to, you know, work with them. And But I have a good rap. And, and when I give them the rap, uh, you can just see their confidence level goes up to the point where they're hugging you and kissing me and all that. And, you know, that that's the great feeling that, that I get. You know, it's never been about the money, Mike. It's just, you know, I work one-on-one -on -one with these guys, and there's nothing like it. You know, I've been backstage, yeah. and I hear you say it, and I know you're half joking when you say it, so I want to make that point. But I hear you say, do you want the knockout rap or do you want the submission rap? Is there a difference? Well, well, there is a difference, and, and, and I'm not joking. You know, well, I, I am to a certain extent because, like I say, psychology at this point is a main thing. And me just, there's more to being a cut man than just working on cuts. There's a mental game that goes with it and preparing these guys and, and making these guys comfortable. And, but I get to understand and asking them if they want the knockout rap or the tap out rap, what kind of fight they're going to be having. That prepares me to see what are the possibilities of them getting cut. If they're going to be in the stand-up, then I know they're going to be throwing blows and, and the chances of them getting cut are probably a little bit higher than if they're in the grappling position. But there is a standard. I'll give them a little bit more rap uh, for the knockout rap just so they can go out there and crack. Uh, so, in joking, but, but in all seriousness. We hear a lot about the struggles that the fighters make to get to where they are, particularly guys like Cain Velasquez. Sure. You're Mexican. Yeah. You have a book called From the Fields to the Gardens. Right. And you, where you document your journey through the combat sports world. And you weren't always a cut man. I mean, you sold tobacco. You, <laughs> you had your own karate school. You were in the Air Force. You studied Muay Thai and Taekwondo in Thailand when right. you were in the Air Force. You have an incredible story. I just, before we get in your story, I want to know, what does it feel like knowing that the journey that you've taken, you've been all over the world, yep. you're world famous, and you came from nothing? Yeah, you know what, it's quite humbling, and believe it or not, last night I, I received a call from one of my friends that I grew up with. We grew up as farm workers. I mean, listen, I picked tomatoes, I picked cotton, I picked peaches. If you've eaten it and you've wore it, I'd probably pick it for you, Mike. And, uh, but from a little town of Planada, California, so proud of me of, of, of the accomplishments that I've done and how I've traveled the world and I've worked with the best fighters in the world. And I've been in movies with, you know, Sylvester Stallone and Woody Harrelson, Antonio Banderas. And, uh, you know, I've had all these opportunities. And then, listen, here I am fighting words with Mike Strzok. So, so life doesn't get much better than that, but it's, it's a mind blower. And, and, and I'm absorbing everything that, uh, that's coming to me. And I'm real grateful for the opportunity that I have uh, to get in this position. A lot of guys, Dana White included, will say, I can't believe that the fight game is what opened all of these doors for me. Right. 
explain how you've traveled the world. You've worked with Klitschko brothers. You worked with Mike Tyson. You worked with some of the best fighters sure. on the planet, and it's all through fighting. I mean, you, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, I don't know if you do or not, but you know Dana White. You know, I, I knew Dana before Dana was Dana. I, we were blue collar trainers. You know, I used to sell boxing equipment to Dana and to other guys, but we were on the gyms. We were breaking sweat and trying to make a buck and and trying to find out where our destiny was taking us. But you know, working with all these great fighters and all that, uh, it, it's 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 quite mind blowing. You know, to to have guys. You're talking about you know the Klitschko brothers and Mike Tyson, but all the great fighters and. UFC and all the great fighters that came out of Pride and Fedor Emelianco, Krokop and you know Brock Lesnar. These guys request me to rap them, and uh, for them to do that, and you know I always revert going back to me being from a little town of Planada, California, as a farm worker, and thinking these people are asking for my services. You know, it's quite a mind blowing experience. Tell me about the time you had vodka with <laughs> Fedor Emelianenko yeah. in Japan. Well, you know, there's more to it than that now, because you know I used to go to. Japan with Josh Barnett and when uh, uh, Josh hired me and, and I would go with him and and uh, he would work with a lot of Japanese fighters and they wanted me to wrap their hands so Josh was kind of like my agent he said you know what I brought Stitch with me I'm paying him to come and work with me if you want him to wrap your hands it's gonna cost you 500 bucks right well Fedor had just come back from an injury he had broken his thumb from I guess punching and uh, the promoters from uh, Pride came and asked me if I could wrap his hands and you know Fedor at this point was at the peak of his career I mean in Pride big fight uh, so I was more than happy to do that. So I walk in the dressing room and just like I'm talking to you, Mike, I, I like to talk to the fighters and find out where they're coming from and I'm wrapping Fedor's hands and he's not saying anything to me, you know. But I work with enough freshness to understand their personalities, right? So finally I finish wrapping both hands and I ask Fedor how they feel and he goes like this. It's like Ivan Drago. He goes, super, super. And that's all he said. Man, I walked out, I was the happiest guy in the world, right? But anyway, he sees Josh and I walk and he calls in the dressing room and he says, hey, you drink, you know, so here we are taking shots of vodka with uh, Fedor Emelianco. I left because I couldn't hang with these guys, you know, I had to go back, but Josh stuck around and uh, since then I've wrapped Fedor, you know, five or six times. Those days, those $500 uh, a wrap days in Japan are over. Right. Explain to me how spoiled the fighters are today. I mean, they always complain about they're underpaid and everything, but explain to me how, how you know, they're, they do kind of get spoiled here, don't they, at UFC? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know if spoiled is the word you want to call for it. I think they're they're privileged to have what, what Dana White is offering them. And, you know, Dana had the insight or, or the vision to say, you know what, if we bring in professional cut men from the boxing industry to help these fighters uh, by wrapping their hands and offering their services of working cuts, number one, we prolong their careers and we minimize the, the possibilities of, of injuries, plus we give that fighter that one more round. Uh, Dana was smart enough to do that, all right? But I don't think when it comes to monetary value, uh, the, the cost that it's, it's saving them, having professional people like us uh, work with them. Let's talk about the cut game for a minute. Yeah, sure. It's grown exponentially. The tools of your trade have grown, haven't they, where you have adrenaline, creams, things like that. It wasn't always like that when you first started, correct? It, the complete opposite. Let me educate you on this okay. now, Mike, because uh, it's funny because, I mean, I've been in the game since like 1985, and there's three medications that uh, the Association of Boxing Commissions, the main bodies for the United States, uh, authorize, and that's adrenaline chloride 1-1000. That's the one that we use in, in the swabs to put on the cuts. The primary purpose for that medication is it closes up the blood vessels. It's like squeezing a hose. Uh, the other two is avatine and thrombin. Those are coagulants, but they're very hard to get. Uh, so those have been the, the typical medicines since I started till now. Uh, the end swells, end swells are the KO swell. I redesigned mine. And matter of fact, last night I was talking to one of the ringside doctors, and he said, you know, Stitch, somebody ought to create an end swell that's curved to contour to the cheekbone. Well, the old ones are straight, mm -hmm. and I, I created one. All right, I thought about that, and you know, common sense took me to this to this pattern. I said, you know, the bones are contoured everywhere you work, and, and the, the mishap, the wrong way of doing uh, end swell, kale swells, you see these cut men will get it and just try to move that swell. Well, that's not the theory, that's not the work, because what you're doing is you're moving that clot over here, and it eventually comes back, but you're damaging more tissue. So the direct thing is direct cold pressure to close up those blood vessels. So I created a kale swell. If you forget your end swell, what do you do to, to improvise an end swell? I always carry two end swells, but you know what? If, if worst case scenario, if you're working a fight, <clears throat> your fighter gets starting to get swell, direct pressure. Even if you have your thumb or this and that, direct pressure, because what happens when you get swelling is you get vessels that pop underneath the skin. 
they accumulate and you create swelling through that. There's just blood accumulation. So if you apply direct pressure, blood has a way of coagulating itself with direct pressure. That's why when you get cut, you apply pressure and it closes. That's what you do with it. More with Stitch. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next on Fighting Words with Mike Straka. Talk about the politics of getting into MMA from boxing. Me trying to learn, Mike, down the road, I, I got blew off a lot of times. That's coming up next on Fighting Words with Mike Straka. Welcome back to Fighting Words with Mike Straka. This week's guest, UFC Cutman, Jacob Stitch Duran. Welcome back to Fighting Words. My guest tonight is Stitch Duran. Stitch, let's talk about your time in the Air Force. You were in Thailand and you saw a Muay Thai fight and it, it, you fell in love with combat sports right there and then. How old were you? Uh, well, you know, I was 22 years old. You know, I uh, joined the Air Force when I was 20 and uh, my second year there, they sent me to Thailand, and I was a young kid, like I said, I'm a farm worker, I didn't even know what Thailand was. I, I joined the Air Force to stay away from the Vietnam War, and, and Thailand just happened to be the base that I was at where the B-52s were at. They loaded them up with bombs and dropped them off in Vietnam. What was your job? I, I was a cop. Uh, but but the, what the cops did is we protected the B-52s and the bomb dumps and, and all that against... You weren't like, you weren't internal affairs. You weren't, uh, you weren't busting your own guys, right? No, no, no. You were just protecting <laughs> no, them. No, no, no. We were, hey, I left my guys alone, man. My job was to protect the base. That's, that's what we did. But, you know, I was always, I always wanted to be a martial artist. If I told myself, as, you know, if I went into the Orient, I always wanted to study Taekwondo. And, uh, but I got to see my first Muay Thai fight, and, and I got hooked on it. And, and that following Monday, I started training and did it for that whole year, and, and I've been doing it ever since. And you owned a karate school, didn't you? I, I opened up my own school. It was called ASK, the American School of Kickboxing. Uh, we combined Taekwondo, Muay Thai with American boxing, and, and I had some great fighters, and uh, we did a great job. And during that time, you were also a sales rep for RJR Tobacco, right? RJ exactly. Reynolds. I worked for RJ Reynolds for about 25 years, and, you know, and that was a blessing because, listen, I only have a high school diploma. And, uh, and my brothers are the ones that got me into this corporate job, and but I did it, you know. And uh, but I opened up my own school. I opened up with a credit card, Mike. Show you about, you know, having big cojones and following my dreams. And I pulled my credit card out, and I paid my rent and and uh, put the carpet down and the paint and got the equipment, and you know, I became successful right off the bat. How did you end up in Las Vegas? I followed my dreams, you know, and and dreams do come true, believe it or not. I always wanted to come to Las Vegas and kickboxing. Worldwide, I was the top cut man. You know, I was recognized worldwide. And, and in boxing, I was starting to, be, you know, get a name for myself. Uh, and this was before UFC came around. So I wanted to come to Las Vegas and, and, and follow my dreams to be the best cut man in boxing. And this time, Las Vegas is the boxing capital of the world, right? So I put in for a job transfer with RJ Reynolds. And about a year later, it's, we're starting to downsize. And they call me and says, look, there's, a, there's an opening in Las Vegas. It's downtown. You don't have to do no traveling, uh, but you have to take a cut and pay. So I took like a $25,000 a year cut and pay. Wow. Uh, but this my, is back in the 80s? Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. back in the 80s. You know, And uh, my wife supported me and my kids supported me. They knew I had a future. And uh, so we packed up the stuff like the Beverly Hillbillies and the U-Haul and drove from Fairfield, California to Las Vegas. And, uh, and it struggled. It was a struggle for a while, you know, and uh, just making up that money that I had lost. And, and people knew me, but not to the extent that they know me now. And then the UFC came around and it, it changed my whole life. Talk about the politics of getting into MMA from boxing from the cut man and, and tape guy standpoint, because from what I read in your book, uh, people don't, don't like sharing their knowledge with newbies and not Leon Tabs and who's been around since UFC one by the way uh, and he was a little more generous but he still gave you a little attitude in the beginning didn't he yeah yeah I did you know and Leon and I are great friends and 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 he's part of the old school and and, and that I have to respect but you know me trying to learn Mike down the road I, I got blew off a lot of times the guys now the, the veteran cut men in boxing well they think that's a secret they're not gonna give you what they know uh, and uh, one guy literally just you know uh, you got to learn from somebody else. That taught me to teach other people. And, and uh, I did put a video out called Giving the Fighter One More Round that, that shows what I do and, and it shows them. But yeah, the, the old school guys, even till now, won't show you their secrets. And if you ask Leon, uh, he'll tell you he don't know. <laughs> it's like the magicians, right? There's, there's a secret to it. Nobody, you guys know the secret, but you don't want to let it out. 
that seems to be the case with them. But once I had really studied the game and understood the cuts and the swelling and all that, there's no secret. It's all proper technique. And if you see the four cut men that work in the UFC and me and Leon and Rudy Hernandez and Don House, we all follow the same formula that I created, and it works. That's why very few fights are stopped on cuts. Let's talk about the Forrest Griffin fight for a sure. second. The Shogun Hua Forrest Griffin fight. He was cut so bad yeah. that that fight could have been stopped without you. No, absolutely, and that was one of my signature fights, and, and that's the one that they use on the cover of the video game and all that. But, but explain to the fans who are watching, who are the fighters understand that. Sure. They know, Forrest knows, and everybody else in that arena who is cage side knows, thank goodness Stitch closed up that wound. You were responsible for him beating Shogun Hua. Yeah, and, and Forrest really g gave me a nice compliment and, and sent me a nice little bonus check. But I went in there with, with the best medicines. I used the adrenaline chloride first, and, and I used the avatine, which really it's the last time I've used the avatine, and that's the coagulant. But what I did is I rolled that up, and I put the adrenaline on the cut. Once I pulled it off, I, I plugged it up with the, the, the avatine, and then I covered it with, I mixed up Vaseline and adrenaline chloride. I covered it up, and I walked out, and I was so proud of that job. And, you know, Dana White Sr. sitting next to me, and Don House is sitting next to me, and, and we're looking at the cut, and it's not bleeding for the first minute, second minute, third minute, fourth minute. We're all saying, you know, the cut's not bleeding. At that point, I knew I did a good job, and then he goes and ends up tapping him out. So, you know, that was, that was what I would say a signature fight, and Forrest has been great for ever since then. Tell us about the time in Los Angeles when you were heading to dinner with the tap out guys and a fight broke out outside the Staples Center. You see a kid fall down, hit his head on a curb. You rushed to help him out. What happened? We were walking out of the Staples Center into, uh, uh, to go meet the guys from tap out for dinner. And, and, and we're there stopping and we, we're signing autographs and all that. And then out to my right, I see a couple guys. I thought they were playing around, but there were a couple drunk guys. But all of a sudden, one of the guys comes out of nowhere and just shoves this other guy. And the guy falls and he hits his head on the cement. And I just hear a thump, thump, I mean, just five feet away from me. And he's knocked out. And I'm thinking, oh, jeez, here I am. So, and all these fans, I mean, there are probably 100 people there. I go to the guy and he's knocked down. He's coming too. And I see and he has a big old cut there. So I'm thinking, oh, jeez, all right. I go and I get my stuff and I start working on him. And <laughs> once, once he comes to, he looks at me. I'm working on him. He says, Stitch, <laughs> you know, and uh, but he was all banged up, and but he had a big old, he had a UFC cut on him. Surreal, yeah, surreal. More with Stitch. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next on Fighting Words with Mike Straka. Tell us about Rocky Balboa. How'd you get in that film? Well, I was a faith of luck. That's coming up next on Fighting Words with Mike Straka. Welcome back to Fighting Words with Mike Straka. This week's guest, UFC Cutman, Jacob Stitch Duran. Welcome back to Fighting Words, and I'm, I'm still, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to be sitting here talking to you right now. It's fun. It's, yeah. you know, talk to me about Sylvester Stallone. When they call me to do the movie. Rocky Balboa. Rocky Balboa. That, that, the that last I, one. The last one and, and the final one. Uh, I was on the computer negotiating a major fight in London and England to follow a fight that I had the following week before in Paris, France. So I had two major boxing events. And I get a call to do the Rocky Balboa movie. And I tell him, I said, look, I'd love to, but I can't because I have this fight in Paris and I got this fight in London. Thanks, man. So I called my wife at work and I said, God, they offered me an op opportunity to be in a Rocky Balboa movie, but I can't go because I got to go to Paris. I got to go to London. She goes, are you crazy? He goes, Rock is an American icon. You have to take this movie. And I thought about it for about 30 minutes, Mike. And I, I told you, I was negotiating with the people in, in London, and I deleted the message. And I said, look, man, between our last conversation and now, I got an opportunity to do the Rocky Balboa movie. I hope you guys don't mind, but I'm taking it. And they, they accepted it. Turned out that the fights in France got canceled anyway. Wow. So anyway, I know, talk about, you know, somebody protects, somebody up there loves me. Kind of a great movie, huh? Yeah. But anyway, Sylvester Stallone, let me tell you about him. I always thought, all right, hey, Rocky, you know, that was him. He's a genius. You know, I've done, like I said, I've done uh, uh, Ocean's Eleven. I've done Play to the Bone with Ron Shelton, a great director. Uh, Sylvester Stallone's the best I've seen. You know, he, he wrote, directed, and he acted in this movie, and he was a genius. And, uh, and really put out a great movie out there. And a great athlete and a great director and a great writer. You know, Randy Couture said the same thing. And what I've noticed is that when I ask fighters what movies inspire them, inevitably, it doesn't matter how old or young they are, they'll say Rocky Absolutely. or Vision Quest, the, the wrestling film. Yeah. 
And I just, I, I find that amazing that even after all these years and how far the, the combat sports have come, Rocky is still their favorite boxing movie. Oh, absolutely. And a little trivia to that now, it's funny because my new sponsor is One More Round. And, and Mark Zucker, when he created One More Round, he did it because the movie that I was in with Rocky Balboa and Rocky's telling his son, you know, I, I got to go one more round. Yep. He says, you know what, that's, that's everybody in life. Everybody, you know, when, when things are down, you know, you have to go take that one step. You have to go that one more round. And that's why that one more round clothing line with us is, is created because of the Rocky Balboa movie. So, Rocky, if you are seeing this, it was created because of you, man. We love you. Speaking of... Sylvester Stallone. He was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. And sure. what are your thoughts on that being from that sport professionally? Well, you know, and, and that's a good question. And, and people have asked that, you know, people, wow, you know, why is Rocky? He's not a fighter. But no, he is a fighter. You know, and the thing about it is in the Boxing Hall of Fame, and congratulations to him, number one. You know, you got guys that are referees and you got Don King that, you know, Bob Arum that are promoters. Well, why not Rocky Balboa? Because he's done so much for the sport uh, on a positive side. And you know, just like you're saying, you know, if somebody's gonna get amped up for a movie, they're gonna look at a Rocky movie. You know, when guys walk in with Eye of the Tiger, you know, for, for their fight, the fans go crazy yep. and all that. So yeah, does he deserve- Matt Sarah uses the Rocky theme yeah, song. Absolutely, does he deserve to be into the uh, International uh, Boxing Hall of Fame? Absolutely, congratulations to him. So Stitch, let's talk about the economics of boxing and the economics of MMA without putting you too much on a spot right. because politics are tough to deal with in any in any organization. Sure, sure. But a guy like Frankie Edgar and Gray Maynard who put on a main event at UFC 125 that I think created a legend in Frankie Edgar in my opinion. Anybody who could survive that and this kid comes back and fights for five more rounds. You don't see boxing matches like that not to take anything away from boxing. But my question to you is why do boxers make $30 million a fight? Well, th that's a good question, but not every fighter makes $30 million a fight. There's an adage or a verbiage in, in boxing that 1% of the fighters make 99% of the money. Now, let me educate you on this because I, I produced a documentary a while back called Boxer's Nightmare. It deals with all the trials and tribulations that fighters go through behind the scenes that nobody sees. You know, bad management and, and, and getting paid $400 you know, for a four-round fight. That's terrible. But a majority of the guys in boxing and on a yearly salary, Mike, have make less than the poverty level uh, income. So they're below the poverty level when it comes to making money. 1%, like say other fighters, make 99% of the money. MMA guys are entirely different because a lot of these guys, even though it's a, it's, it's a fir first time fight for a guy in the UFC, they're probably more making as much money as a 10 round fighter in boxing because number one of sponsors and then the money they get if they win. So uh, boxing was saying, wow, you know, MMA guys don't make money. When you look at it as a whole, you take that 1% off the De La Hoyas, the Pacquiao's and all that, MMA's doing a lot better than boxing. UFC 118, did you rap James Tony? I did. I rapped both Randy Couture and James Tony. And I'll tell you a story here. I, I see James Tony in the dressing room, right, or in the lobby, 8, 8.30 in the morning. They say, hey, Stitch, you going to rap my hands? Uh, no, no. I said, whose corner are you going to work in? I said, well, I don't know. I know who's going around going to work. And I'm always in the red corner. Well, I don't know, man. It was mine or Randy's. I said, well, probably Randy. F you. You know? So he starts walking away, and then he turns around about 10 feet later. He says, Stitch, you going to wrap my hands? I said, yeah, Tony. I'd love to wrap your hands, James. So you, you, know, you work the red corner always. How does that get decided? Well, it, it does a couple of things. It's Burt Watson, you know, he's our coordinator that coordinates everybody. And I kind of coordinate the cut men. So I'm always in the red corner for that event. And we're neutral. You know, we're there to help every fighter is. You know, whoever we get is that's who we take care of. And, and we give them 150%. So to eliminate that, I'm always in the red corner and Leon's in the blue. And whoever the UFC puts in the red corner, that's, that's them. Uh, when it comes to wrapping hands, you know, a lot of people want me to wrap their hands. But uh, well, I have my list. If they give me five guys, I'll do eight guys because I, it's tough for me to say no to these guys. Talk about Brock Lesnar, UFC 100. He was going berserk after that fight. Yeah. And you yeah. told the commission guys, let him go. Let him go. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? There's certain times and certain moments that you have to let that fighter do what he has to do. He has to because their energy is just so pumped up. Even the fight with uh, Shane Carwin, he got cut, and I'm trying to clean him up. He's like a little kid. He says, I said, I said Brock, I got to clean you up. He's like a little kid. He says, Stitch, I'm not ready yet. And he gets up and he jumps on top of the octagon, you know. And to me, I said, you know what, that's, that's great. Let him do what he has to do. After he came down, I cleaned him up. Clay Guida, for instance, last, uh, the last time I saw him fight, he was bouncing around yeah. you know, before the fight, and you're, you got to stop him, and you got to put the Vaseline on his face. 
but you always say something to him in his ear. What do you say to him before the fight? Well, you know, with Clay Guida and this last one, I told him his mother, just a, a sweet, sweet lady. I told him, I said, your mother wants me to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you like my son. And, and you know, those are little words of encouragement, Mike, that, that we go just, you know, things that I tell these guys all the time. Yeah, but that's, that's the message I gave him. Well, Stitch, I could talk to you all night long, but the show's only a half hour, and, uh, man, Thank you so much for doing the show. Mike, really, it's been a pleasure, man. And, uh, you know, thank, him, thank me, or thank you, actually, for giving me that opportunity. Well, good luck with the book. I thought it was fantastic. Thank, thanks. Great stories. We've got to do it again, man. You know, I, I still want to talk. All right. That's been Fighting Words this week. Until next week, I'm Mike Straka. Enjoy the fights.